Hey, welcome back. Uh, we are going to wrap up our chapter eight notes uh, with our population lecture number three. Uh, today in class, I left you with this little kind of dire uh, idea. Where where are we going to end up as a human population? So if you recall, right, we have populations that see this exponential growth over time. And we reach that biotic potential, which is kind of our maximum growth rate. Then environmental resistance sets in and things level off. And in a healthy population, we hover around that carrying capacity, maybe go a little above and a little below over time. We kind of just hover around that point. All right? Whereas some populations, if left uh, able to overshoot or exceed their carrying capacity, they experience this idea of what's called a population crash with the mass die-off due to lack of food, etc. All right? Um, and... Really, uh, what ends up happening with human population is pure conjecture because we don't know. We haven't ever run that experiment with humans uh, where we have a leveling off of our population that's expected to happen this century. And um, we don't know what human population looks like when uh, we, we've leveled off. We don't know if it's going to be at a level that, that the environment can sustain. Uh, it comes down to whether we find substitutes for things like fossil fuels uh, because we rely very, very heavily on fossil fuels to produce our food. Uh, and so, you know, we might have pretty vast supplies left, but they will uh, run out eventually, particularly uh, if we keep increasing the global population and as other countries uh, advance technologically. So we don't know really what's going to happen. Um, or, or maybe it's somewhere in between. You know, where the population, uh, just due to people choosing to have fewer children, uh, decreases for some time and we level off at a lower number. Uh, so it's not really an either or. We might end up somewhere in between those two areas. Maybe the population dwindles down to about 4 billion over time. I mean, who knows? Uh, but it, it is worth thinking about and it's going to be an interesting turn of events, uh, over the coming decades. So, uh, we talked about density dependent factors, like how much food is available and how much, how quickly disease spreads and predation. Uh, other things uh, affect populations too that aren't really dependent on density. And usually these would be like natural disaster type things. All right. So like a killing frost, for example, whether there's a uh, hundred plants per square meter or two plants per square meter, it could kill all of them, uh, regardless of how dense the population is. Uh, a severe blizzard or a fire, things like that. So, uh, some, some things, natural disasters, uh, affect the size of the population, but it's not really dependent on how big or how dense that population is. So make sure again, you can differentiate between density dependent and density independent factors. All right. Um, now moving on, uh, reproductive strategies. So when we talk about reproductive strategies, uh, different organisms in nature sort of have uh, different ways of overcoming uh, Darwinian selection. All right. Uh, some species just uh, have a ton of babies, right? Uh, and they throw a bunch of them out there in hopes that they will uh, survive. Okay. Um, those types of species are what we call our selective species. Now, typically, they're going to have a relatively small body size, right? Uh, mature early, a short lifespan but large broods, and a brood is referring to how many offspring they have at a time. Um, but because of these large broods, um, again, the, the strategy here is have a bunch of babies, hope some of them survive to maturity to have more babies. All right? That's what we call an R-selected species. Uh, K-selected species are kind of the other side of that spectrum in which we have um, species that have very few offspring, but... In order to make up for not having very many offspring, they, they kind of intensively care for those offspring to help them survive to maturity. Uh, both are effective strategies in nature because we see examples of both uh, all over the place. Okay, so things like mice and rabbits would be more R-selected uh, in terms of mammals. Elephants and humans would be more the K-selected species. Okay, um, and of course, we could also view this as a spectrum. Some maybe fall a little bit more on the R side, a little more on the K side, but not necessarily entirely in one category. All right, um, but I do want you guys to understand the differentiation between an R-selected species and a K-selected species and the survivorship 
curves that are associated with that. So here's the way to read survivorship. We have type 1, type 2, and type 3 survivorship curves. Okay, uh, so a type 1 would be similar to what humans have. So let's say of uh, X number of uh, individuals, right? As they progress, we see that lots of humans survive to maturity. So out of a thousand humans, lots of them will survive to maturity. And that's because uh, we sort of pretty intensively care for our young to help them to survive. Okay? Um, so the type 1 tends to be with our K-selected species. Okay? Well, there's not a lot of them, but of the ones that are born, many of them do survive. On the other hand, with our R-selected species, all right, um, we're going to have a relatively low percentage of individuals that do survive to maturity. Okay? Um, and again, they make up for that by just having a very large number of offspring. All right. Um, and then, so the type 3 matches our R-selected species. Type 1 is with K. And then type 2 are some of those species, like I said, that fall maybe on the spectrum in between there, those two. Okay, and just to add uh, some complexity, some species are kind of both. Like herring gulls, for example, do that type 3 initially, right, and then follow more of a type 2 pattern. Okay, uh, so the, you know, it's not cut and dry with different species, but there are different survivorship curves based on different reproductive strategies. Both are effective. Both have withstood the test of time and sort of helped to survive Darwinian evolution or Darwinian selection. Uh, they're just different strategies and therefore different survivorship curves that go along with that. Okay? Now, um, moving on, the final piece to our chapter eight is understanding demographics. So let's take a look at this graph. All right? What it's showing is, um, the, the birth and death rate of a country over time as it undergoes uh, changes, what they call a demographic transition. Okay, so here's what I want us to notice. Notice at the beginning, uh, between 1900 and 1925, we have a pretty high birth rate, which is this blue line, and we also have an associated high death rate. Okay, so what we'd expect to see is uh, a large number of children born per female, but not so many of them surviving to maturity. Okay, so that would be like uh, a third world country with not a lot of medical attention and so on. Uh, so notice what happens farther down our, our, our timeline here is we see uh, between 1925 and 1975 the birth rate remaining high. Okay, and during that time, we also see an associated drop-off in our death rate, all right? Uh, and so what we would probably attribute that to is um, a transition from becoming a pre-industrial country to a more industrialized country, in which case we have fewer deaths because of advancements in technology and medicine, all right? Um, now, notice what happens uh, around 1975. The death rate remains low, the birth rate also drops, all right? So it's during that drop time right there that is very typical of a country that's making that transition. So initially, we see a decrease in death rate, but in a, there's a culturally, the birth rate remains high. Over time, with a lower death rate, uh, improved education, etc., there's almost always an associated drop in birth rate. All right, and this, uh, this growth curve actually right here is for Mexico, uh, interestingly. All right, so when I say demographic transition, what I want you to understand is uh, there's sort of different stages uh, countries are in in terms of industrialization and the associated uh, medical advancements and education levels of its individuals. All right, so our pre-industrial stage, we would associate uh, this either with uh, Old, you know, back, if you go back in history, I guess they're all technically pre-industrial. But today's uh, world, we have countries in various stages. So these pre-industrial stages, what we call mostly our third world countries. Uh, the technology level per citizen is very low. Education level per citizen is relatively low. Okay. Um, and what we see in terms of population growth is 
high birth and high death rates. All right. Um, and population would grow fairly modestly. Now, most countries in today's world are, if they're not uh, industrial, they're, they're undergoing some sort of transition. Um, some great examples of that that are a little later on that transition are countries like China, uh, Mexico, I guess you call still transitioning, but also places like India. All right. Um, and so during the transitional stage, we see this lowered death rate. Okay. And um, that's what we saw in that initial graph. So while countries transitioning from pre-industrial to an industrialized country or a developed country, first the death rate drops. All right. And because of that, it's during that transition that we see our most rapid population growth. Okay. Um, and that's because culturally, the birth rate remains high, at least in the beginning of this transition. All right. So the birth rate remains high, but the death rate goes down. That's when we're going to see rapid population growth. Uh, so once a country's kind of gone through the cultural and technological transformations to become an industrial stage, what we start to see is a decline in birth rate. Um, and that is mostly due, uh, the number one indicator, by the way, of birth rates is the education level uh, or the status of women in that society. So in our industrialized countries, uh, the females are seeking out education uh, much more similar to the males. Uh, and because they're extending that uh, their, their period of reproduction to later in life, we see a decline in birth rates. And many women are deciding to work rather than stay home, uh, which usually makes them choose to have fewer children as well. All right, so during the industrial stage, we see a slowing of that uh, growth rate. And again, that's just usually due to a cultural shift to women having deciding to have fewer children. All right? And then finally, uh, we have the post-industrial world, uh, which the U.S. is interesting because it doesn't entirely fit any one of these categories because of immigration. But uh, I would say countries like Denmark, uh, Germany, most of Western Europe are in this post-industrial stage uh, where they have low birth rates and low death rates. All right, and in that case, the population is either declining or uh, very, very slowly growing or not growing at all, somewhere in that uh, framework. And that's just because, uh, you know, the, the, the birth rate, about two children per female, uh, is what you need just to replace the current population. The birth rate is actually less than two in some cases. Um, which does lead to a declining population over time. And this that's just normal part of the demographic transition. So when I say demographic transition, I'm talking about moving from the pre-industrial stage to the transitional, to the industrial, and eventually to post-industrial. Now, technologically and educationally speaking, the U.S. is in that post-industrial stage. Uh, but we also have lots of immigration. Um, we'll talk about why that's important here in just a minute. Um, but just a quick recap, right? Pre-industrial stage, high birth rate, high death rate, uh, relatively slow growing population. During the transition phase, birth rate remains high at first. Decline in death rate, and therefore our growth rate sort of skyrockets during that time. Okay. During the industrial stage, we see a decline in birth rates, a low death rate, and so we see that logistic growth in our country's population. Okay, then in our post-industrial, we see either slow or little growth, and then eventually even we would expect to see a sort of decline. All right, so uh, something to think about is if we move the whole world over into a, this sort of post-industrial stage, uh, we might expect to see a leveling off of that population and then an associated decline afterward. And ideally that decline, if it occurs, would be due to people having fewer children not because of some sort of mass die-off because we overshot our carrying capacity, okay? Uh, that, that creates kind of a bleak picture for, for our future. We hope we see just sort of this kind of natural drop-off uh, associated with just cultural shifts. All right. Um, now, let's compare total fertility rate in some of our countries. This is a TFR up here, by the way, and we'll talk more about what TFR means in Chapter 9. But... If you look at various countries throughout the world uh, over time, countries like Brazil have gone from a fertility rate of over 6 
to just over two. So Brazil, we would expect to not be growing very quickly anymore. China, interestingly, has an extremely low fertility rate, but as many of you guys know, uh, that's because of government policy. Uh, they call it the one-child policy, which, again, we will talk about that in much more detail in Chapter 9. Um, Egypt, we're seeing an associated drop. India, a big drop. Mexico, a very large drop in fertility rates. But then we go places like Nigeria. Okay, so based on the fact that Nigeria still has this extremely high fertility rate, uh, we would say that Nigeria is probably just going through that transition at this point. So culturally, Nigeria... Uh, they're going to have a high fertility rate, but uh, they are undergoing a transition, in which case the medical care, et cetera, is much better than it was even just a couple decades ago. Uh, and so we're going to expect the population of Nigeria to skyrocket. In fact, there's projections that puts them at a population uh, surpassing the U.S. Uh, in the relatively near future because of that population growth momentum they have right now. All right, now this takes us finally uh, to what we call age structure diagrams. And with these diagrams, essentially, we look at the shape of these pyramid-looking objects to determine what type of growth we would expect to see. And so he, here's the, the basic rundown, and I'll address this in a little more detail in an upcoming lesson as a follow-up. But um, we have uh, an expanding population. So what we'd expect to see in an expanding population is a large number of people in our pre-reproductive stage, okay, relative to the generations before them. Now, why that's important is we have to picture in the future, this large group is going to be bumping up into that reproductive stage, all right? So we would project more people reproducing in the future, okay? Uh, so because our reproductive group is going to increase in size, uh, we would then predict a fairly rapid increase in our population over time. Now, a stable population, if you look, uh, has maybe slightly more individuals in that pre-reproductive stage than they have in the reproductive stage. So in the future, we expect about the same number of people to be reproducing. Okay, and so uh, that would result in a declining population that would result in a stable population. Now, to contrast that, in a declining population, we have fertility rates that are less than replacement level. All right, replacement level, by the way, is 2.1 children per female, and the 0.1 makes up for uh, things like people that just don't reproduce later on in life or people who can't reproduce because of uh, various reasons, right? So when that fertility rate is less than 2.1, we would expect our population to decline because essentially in the future, fewer people will be reproducing over time. Uh, and of course, that would be associated with a, a decline in our population size. And that's what we see in places like Japan and Belgium and Germany, etc. All right. Um, so we will examine these in more detail. One of those things, again, that you are guaranteed to see on the AP test is something about age structure diagrams. All right. So some specific examples. I brought up Nigeria before. We'll look at that structure. Okay, now their survivorship is going up because of advancements in technology. They are undergoing a transition, but look at what's going to happen to the number of individuals reproducing in the relatively near future. Right, they have some huge population growth momentum there. Uh, countries like the United States, uh, interesting dynamic here. Okay, we are a stable population now. Uh, again, we do have this immigration issue to look at, and I'm going to tie an idea here in just a minute. Uh, and then we contrast that with Germany. If you look at our reproductive group here, right, we're going to see fewer people of reproductive age in the future than there are presently, and would therefore expect a, a relatively slow decline in those populations. All right? Now, um, worldwide, let's look at fertility rates. Which country or which continent would you expect to see the most rapid growth? Of course, we'd expect to see that in uh, Africa, where the largest percentage of people under the age of 15, so that means the largest number of people of reproductive age in the relatively new future in Africa. Uh, look at Europe, right? A uh, relatively small population. Now, if we go worldwide, though, so for focusing on the global human population, almost 30% of the global population 
is under the age of 15, which means we actually still uh, have some fairly hefty population growth momentum coming up, all right? Uh, which could cause a large increase in worldwide birth rates. Um, and we'll have to kind of wait and see what happens there. So last part of uh, chapter right here, they talk about immigration because the U.S. is still receiving lots of numbers of people, large numbers of people from immigration, okay? Um, and remember I talked about the, the degree of education uh, and how that is linked to birth rates. Uh, part of the reason the U.S. is growing is uh, our immigration um, adds people to the population in the first place. Uh, but their education level is kind of all over the place, and we have a really large number of people with a less than high school education uh, in terms of our immigration, almost a third of them, which is a much larger proportion than what we have in the U.S. as a whole. Uh, and so that is sort of artificially uh, linking uh, elevated birth rates in the U.S. Uh, because of immigrants who are coming in uh, and having a larger than average number of children. Uh, and not saying that's a bad thing. It's just, it is, it's an is, and it's worth pointing out. Because yes, we are in that post-industrial phase, but because of our large numbers of immigrants uh, with relatively high fertility rates compared to the U.S. as a whole, it's sort of artificially uh, increasing our growth rate compared to our counterparts in Europe. Okay? Uh, I am done talking at you guys for now. You guys will get to interact with a lot of this information in class. Uh, take care.